Zakaria, I'm good to see you after many years. I'm glad that you recovered from COVID and may Allah give a complete cure. And I also want to thank um, Professor Sarhan uh, for inviting me to give this keynote speech. So the title of my speech is Islamic Finance Today and Tomorrow. So pretty much I'll follow my slide because I've been up all night. It's 8 a.m. in New Orleans time in order to keep my thought process straight. So Islamic finance, as you know, is increasingly attracting attention among investors worldwide, especially in 2019, which saw a double digit growth in assets. Despite the simultaneous year for global financial markets last year, due to COVID-19 pandemic, there is growing interest due to three reasons greater appreciation around the world that Islamic finance plays in responsible investing, geographical interest in markets where Islamic finance is gaining prominence, as well as digital transformation, which makes Islamic investments more accessible. In 1975, Islamic finance industry was viewed as an impossible alternative to the centuries old conventional banking system. After 45 years, a handful of Islamic financial institutions could impact the global financial market. And today there are more than 1400 Islamic financial institutions spread over 80 plus countries. Through the multitude of financial products and services, including takaful and wealth management, Islamic finance has widened its segment to serve non-Muslim consumers and investors as well. Now, Islamic finance emerged 50 years ago, as I said in the previous slide, in countries with large Muslim population, aiming to ensure that funding sources were Sharia compliant and governed by principles of Islam. In 2019, Islamic finance assets amounted to US $2.88 trillion, the highest recorded growth for the industry since the global financial crisis. The prospects look very positive. By 2024, this is set to rise to US $3.69 trillion. So if you look at the number, in 2008 and 9, during the financial crisis, the Islamic finance industry was managing funds reaching about 800 billion to 1 trillion. Now, 2019 and 20, the funds value under Islamic finance management increased by 150% during COVID-19. Now, how can Islamic finance industry will reach, let's say, 20 trillion dollar mark? You have to remember, even the Islamic finance is growing double digit growth rate, growth rate is higher than conventional finance. It is still a minuscule of total global financial market. So if you look at in a more granular way, the data coming from ICD, uh, Refinitiv, the Gulf Cooperation Council region accounts for the largest share of global Islamic financial assets, which is about 45%, followed by the rest of Middle East and South Asia which is about 26%, and Southeast Asia, which is about 24%. Africa offers growth potential as African institutions use Sukuk as alternative funding sources, and issuance is supported by increasing financing needs in Africa, especially for infrastructure projects. The UK, is the biggest center for Sharia compliant finance in the West. It is also home to the world's first actively managed equity Sharia compliant exchange traded fund, which is launched in September, 2020. Now, the growing industry, it is also attracting new interest globally. The acceleration of technology as a result of COVID-19, financial institutions, including Islamic institutions are offering their products by digital platforms, making it easier to access. Sustainability has also become a more important consideration 
for Muslim investors, increasing interest in the ethical and responsible investing dynamics of Islamic finance products and services. As you know, during the COVID 2020 Islamic Development Bank issued its first sustainable sukuk, and Malaysian government also came up with sustainable and social impact sukuk. As more awareness and knowledge of Islamic finance starts to build up in non Muslim countries, we project a steady growth in Islamic finance assets and expansion in Sharia compliant investments. So this is another granular way. If you look at Islamic finance, it is divided into different sectors like banking asset, sukuk outstanding, Islamic funds asset, takaful contribution. You will see that Islamic banking is the majority of the uh, asset stream is about 73% and the rest are um, non-banking Islamic financial instruments. Now, it is also, as I said before, is heavily, um, I mean, concentrated in the GCC, Southeast Asia, Middle East and South Asia, and the rest of the world is still have a way to catch up. So about almost 90%, 95% assets are coming from this, this region, GCC, South Asia, Southeast Asia. Now, if you try to connect ESG or Sustainable Development Goal or Environmental, Social and Governance Framework that has become a buzzword nowadays. And it has a natural role to play in that uh, segment because portfolio diversification, the growing awareness among global investors of the synergy between ESG investing and Islamic finance contributes to the rising demand for Sharia compliant investments as an alternative to more traditional ESG investments. The complementary investment approaches, Islamic finance and ESG investing share significant common ground offering products that appeal to Muslim and non-Muslim investors and hold strong practices and policies that each can learn from each other. <coughs> so what are the basic foundational principles of Islamic finance? Of course, we start with Tawhid. This is part of our part and parcel of our article of faith, oneness of God. Allah is the sustainer. Allah is the owner of everything. And man is the trustee. Everything is created for use of man. Prohibition of interest, system of zakat and sadaka, and concept of halal and haram. Now, Islamic finance is rooted in divine law. So there is a prohibition of harmful transactions. It involves economic justice. It's a justice for all humanity. It's not only for Muslim, it Muslim and non-Muslim alike. Circulation of wealth is a key. Investor in interest concentrates wealth. That's why interest is prohibited, prohibited in Islam. Commoditization. The bag by the real assets for real growth. So finance cannot be for the finance sake. Financialization is discouraged. But if the finance is attached to the real activity, that is encouraged. We call Islamic finance as a risk sharing uh, finance. It does not transfer risk to other parties. Two parties, when they engage in Islamic finance, share the risk together. So if you compare lending in a debt based economy, and investing in an ethical equity-based economy because Islamic finance, the essence, is more prone towards equity rather than to debt. Of course, there is a option for debt in order to do working capital management, but the essence is the long-term financing. So in a lending framework, in a debt-based, you have a win-lose framework. That means it's a zero-sum game. But in an Islamic equity-based framework, Everybody wins. It's a win-win or positive sum game. Now, in lending-based economy, it creates debt. In Islamic economy, our equity-based framework, invest in real assets. In debt-based economy, risk is transferred. But in ethical equity-based economy, risk is shared. Now, 
lending or debt-based economy, unfair gains from profit and losses, but in equity-based in Islamic framework, just and fair profit and losses sharing for everyone. Now in a debt-based economy, rich gets richer, poor gets poorer, the, the, the social inequality increases. Um, uh, there are a sort of uh, group of people controls and owns the majority of the share. You'll be surprised to know that with the world's 50% wealth is owned by 1% people. As a matter of fact, even if you go to the granular way, 10 richest person in the world also owns about roughly 50% of the world wealth. But in Islamic equity-based framework, justice and equity for everyone. So the fundamental teachings of Sharia and finance it can be summarized in three broad ways. We have the prohibition of interest. Capital cannot be borrowed or lent on the basis of interest. The contracts on notional amounts, treating currencies and as asset classes, purchase and sale of risk and options are non sharia compliant. Contracts are based on principles of risk sharing, avoidance of excessive uncertainty and real asset backed or real asset-based transactions. And there is also restriction activities that are not in the public interest, the concept of halal and haram. Islamic financial institutions do not deal with any entity, nor transact in restricted activities, for example, gambling, alcohol, drugs, weapons, and industries or activities that have a negative impact on societies. So, Societal values are at the forefront with both Islamic and EIG investing. Sharia restrictions on activities or industries that, not, that are not in the public interest are consistent with the negative screening of EIG approach. The environmental objectives or climate finance create a convergence between EIG investing and Islamic finance. For example, Green Sukuk, a Sharia compliant financial instrument like a bond are designed to finance sustainable, climate resilient and environmental friendly projects, generating returns in line with Sharia principles. So what are the features of impact investment? First, there's the intentionality of the impact and investment must be made with the explicit intention that the investment have a positive social or environmental impact. There has to be a financial return. The investment has a return on capital and it is not an act of philanthropy. There are other parts of Islamic finance that does that, Islamic social finance, Zakat, Sadaqa, Kordul Hassan, and so on. A range of asset classes, investment target, a rate of return somewhere between below market to fixed adjustment market rate across asset classes. So Islamic finance and EHG finance or impact investing more like long-term investing rather than short-term. So short-termism is discouraged in Islamic finance and EAG impact investing framework. You can measure impact. The investor must be committed to measuring the social or environmental impact of the investment. So impact investment is intended to generate positive, measurable social and environmental impacts along with financial returns. The emergence of impact investment, social and environmental as a financial market is relatively recent, despite the long history of the social economy in the. Now key drivers behind the emergence of impact investment include the changing investor preferences, demographics, the changing long-term risk models. That's where the marketing guy come in and play how to uh, make it more popular to the um, consumers. Nevertheless, the impact investment market is still under institutionalized. It lacks consistent terminology, consolidated data performance or regulations. So if you look at the market size and return, if you look the entire impact investment space ecosystem, so you have on the one aspect is grant, Estimated market size is about 75 billion or approximated as 5% total foundation assets globally. Then you have project related investment 
and you no know, market related investment pri also included in the 5% grant allocation mri could potentially equal the assets of all foundations which is approximately about 1.5 trillion dollar globally now impact investment itself according to a survey published 2020 gin estimated the core impact investment market is about 715 billion dollar now the development finance on the other hand 25 h HIPSO signatory development finance institutions could be seen as impact investors with a total asset of $724 billion. And expected risk adjusted returns are expected to be approximately about 10%. But if you come to the other extreme, ESG finance in 2018, more than half of all global assets under management followed some form of ESG with a market size of $54 trillion. The evidence suggests that over 95% of ESG is negative. I mean, negative in a sense that it's used negative screening in order to invest into uh, environment and social projects. Now, there are some also commonality in faith tradition about this ESG financing or impact financing. If you look at Christianity, Christianity can take its investing principle from both the Old and New Testament, providing guidance of where one should invest or not. And impact investment is supported by Christian stewardship and is consistent with principles laid out in encyclicals, such as common priority to address care for the planet. Judaism has a clear set of specific roles for the conducting of financial and commercial activities within the stated values are clear justifications for impact investment. The drive to act intentionally to make positive changes to the society. And Islam, it has taken a perfect form. Islam through the Quran and other texts or sayings of the prophet lays out a set of rules concerning investment more than other faith and enough for a separate system of finance. So, Islamic finance or ecosystem can be an independent entity by itself. Islamic scriptural support for impact investment comes from the explicit responsibility for Muslims to preserve the art as its stewards, as is stated in the Quran. We have been made as Khalifa to the world. Now there are other faiths, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism and Sikhism also talks about impact investing, but in a different way. We call these dharmic principles, emphasize environmental stewardship, sustainability, and improving the general welfare of the world. Therefore, it may be considered dharmically correct for an investing entity to invest in those opportunities that also provide for the betterment of the environment and society. Buddhism also stresses the idea of right livelihood, doing business without causing harm or violence to others. Ideally, decision making would be made using an integrated framework or mindfulness, concentration, and wisdom. Two principles that guide the Sheikh views on finance and wealth creation are Dharma Shal, the pursuit of social justice and social responsibility, and Rihat Mayurida, the show code of discipline, the Sikh code of discipline. As such, investing stocks and shares may not appeal to many six. Impact investment, however, aligns with this principle very well. So if you want to combine this faith tradition and the principles of investment, as you see, the, there are seven religions we are talking about. So there are specific principles investment are given in Christian and Islam and Judaism. Now, Hinduism, Buddhism, Sikhism, principle from which investment principle can be derived. And if you look at the last column, principle that support investment, all religions have something to say about impact investing that is good for the society and the environment. So if we look specifically and try to um, uh, compare the ESG investing in Islamic finance, now factors like, for example, considers environmental social factors, both cases it did do, life protection, avoids adverse effects on life, both converges on this principle, 
role in development and achieving the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, both types of finance converges. Exclusion is screening to avoid and exclude investment that are not aligned with their morals criteria, both converge on this point. Established governance is still at early stages in EH investing, but in Islamic finance is rather legalistic, or we call this Sharia based. Religious foundation, EHG is increasingly secular, but the crux of Islamic finance is the faith of Islam. Derivatives and sale of market risk are allowed in EHG, but in Islamic finance, it depends. Most financial derivatives are prohibited. Best in class screening and active selection is present in EHG. The not generally used in Islamic finance, stewardship is EHG, but not in Islamic finance because Islamic finance is open to everyone. So if you look at the digital transformation in the Islamic finance space, the FinTech innovation, countries across Asia, Europe, and the Middle East, and the US have created dedicated startup hubs, venture capital initiatives, regulatory sandbox, and funding programs like Islamic Robo Advisors. Crypto space, Industry stakeholders have taken various initiatives to create alternatives for digital asset and trading platforms that are in accordance with the Sharia principles. And you have the RackTech blockchain aims to solve the regulatory and compliance barriers using robust digital tools to achieve compliance with Sharia requirements. Several Islamic banks are already using or testing blockchain to assist with payments and remittances. So this is an example of Islamic financial services and Islamic finance, fintech examples. Let me give one for each. Like form funding, if you look at um, uh, custody-based deposits can also be based on court. Pay halal is an example. Trade finance, Morabha working capital, Wadfi or Bahrain is a digital banking platform provider. Financing, Morabha, Mudaraba, Musharaka, Ethics Crowd, Singapore, Indonesia, if you talk about Islamic microfinance, Blossom Finance is an example doing that. Capital market, Islamic bank treasury, Sukuk, Islamic bonds, Adab solution, crypto exchange, wealth management, Sharia compliant wealth management for retail and high net worth individuals. You have Wahed, US robot advisory investment platform. You have Hello Gold, blockchain based gold investment. And insurance, Takaful, you have uplift mutuals and re takaful you have insure halal. So we need higher level of standardization to drive the international adoption of Islamic finance. The efforts of industry bodies have largely reduced differences in the interpretation of practice of Sharia principles to ensure stability and integrity. In cases where it requires greater clarity, institutions rely, recognize authorities, like Islamic scholars to provide legal guidance and greater assurance of Sharia compliance. Uniformity in the standards will create scalability, improve public confidence, increase corps border marketability. It will enhance transparency and consistency in financial reporting. Regulators recognize the necessity of a comprehensive and more structured legislative framework for Islamic finance to accelerate growth and reduce discrepancies around the globe. So there are different supporting institutions to help this Islamic finance industry worldwide. You have IFSB, Islamic Financial Services Board based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. It provides governance and disclosure requirements for Sharia compliant institution. You have AOFI, Accounting and Auditing Organization for Islamic Financial Institutions based in Bahrain. It provides standardization of Sharia rules through publication of standards for Sharia contracts and principles. Then you also have International Islamic Financial Market, also based in uh, Dubai, I believe, provides standardization of contracts in carriers such as risk participation, interbank transaction, and money markets. Now, of course, you have the Islamic Development Bank, and actually Islamic Development Bank has created or was involved in creation of these different entities to help the Islamic finance industries. So in it's an overlooked asset class. How can you make it popular, market this Islamic finance to wider 
public, both Muslim and non-Muslim. In the coming years, Sharia compliant assets are expected to keep growing, driven by rising interest from investors beyond Muslim economies due to increasing demand for a sustainable, stakeholder focused and socially responsible financial system. There has to be greater digitization and fintech collaboration and its opportunities for scalability and industry efficiencies by a greater harmonization of Sharia practices and standards. So there are several issues in Islamic finance and somebody wants to criticize what is lacking or shortcomings. We still do not have a full-fledged Islamic economic system implemented in the world. Even in Muslim countries, we are still following conventional Western financial system, no Sharia compliant Islamic monetary policy, no Sharia compliant fiscal policy. Makasid al Sharia oriented approach is not accepted or the essence of Sharia for the common good. No uniform way of adoption of Islamic economics is formulated. Islamic finance still is a mimicking of capitalism in the name of Islamic finance. No Islamic benchmarking system for Yashan compliant products and services. So do not have benchmark that against which we can measure our performance. We still have lack of awareness, lack of knowledge, lack of human capital pool, and of course, in many cases, lack of political support. Now, we very often we say that Islamic finance industry is mostly driven by Islamic banks, which are basically Morabaha banking, but Modaraba, Mosharaka, Nijara, Salam, Istisana, these are more or like um, partnership type of financing or profit loss sharing based financing mode. That is only 20%. But if you look at Morabaha trade financing, Musawama, Tawaruk, these are 80% of the industry. So our goal should be to make this 80% to 80% to partnership type of financing. Now the question is, there are a lot of questions among the consumers, among the adopters who uh, invest in Islamic finance, knowingly, not knowingly. First thing is, what ethics had to do with finance? It's finance. How can we expand our business without taking loans? Is it possible? Interest has become part and parcel of global financial system. How can we do live without it? It is impossible to have two bank systems of banking. Now, many countries, you know, you have a dual banking system, Islamic conventional. It is the same thing, only the names differ, interest to profit. If we forsake dealing in interest, we will be left out of the business. We cannot do business with the rest of the world. Suitable in those good olden days, 1400 years ago, or during the prophetic era or right after that, but it is not, uh, fear, but not possible in the fiercely competitive modern markets only be applicable in Islamic countries. It is just a dream, never can be a reality, but it is not so. So let me go through a few options. And I say this, I am to plain because I'm borrowing the idea from Im, 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 Imran Tofik. So first one is awareness, creating awareness locally, regionally and globally through mass media to promote Islamic finance and its benefits. Education, you educate students, customers, conventional bankers and Sharia scholars to look for an alternative system and benefit from Islamic finance offerings. New horizons, moving to new horizons and seizing opportunities with potential growth. For example, Africa, China, Indonesia, Bangladesh. Micro, small, medium enterprises supporting MSMEs through Islamic finance solutions with a robust mechanism in place to encourage funding them while they're sharing risk and return. Number five, people and partnership offering pure Islamic finance products like Mudaraba and Musharaka to support budding entrepreneurs who can create jobs to an ailing any economy. Takaful, encourage Takaful at all levels with innovative cover coverages to support the Islamic finance industry while supporting people with uncertainties. Tawaruk, avoiding Tawaruk, commodity Morabaha and similar products with no impact on global scale in the long run, as I said before. Unity and diversity promote to work on a common platform or objectives 
to introduce new Sharia compliant products to the market while working on their respective mandates with regulators, so-called scalability. Number nine, level playing field. Establish a level playing field with that of conventional banking and finance industry through taxation, reform taxation, regulation, etc. Synergies, strengthen the Islamic finance industry through mergers and acquisition of Islamic banks and Islamic financial institutions to achieve scale to do bigger deals for bigger impact globally. Beyond charity, promote Islamic microfinance and self-employment projects to support the poor, needy, and the downtrodden by empowering them instead of stretching their hand. New breed apart, encouraging recent graduates to build a career in Islamic finance and ethical entrepreneurship. So the educational institution has to come up with that type of program. Now, practice, 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 persuade colleges and universities to encourage practitioners to come on board as faculty members, along with academicians. Grooming talents, allocate resources to absorb management trainees and the leadership trainees as part of continuous development programs every year. Food for thought and health, support farmers and agriculture initiatives through widespread salam products, taking experience and success stories from other countries. Innovative business structures, build and innovate new structures independent of banking regulations to add further impetus to Islamic finance operating outside the regulatory framework. Beyond retail and corporate banking, encourage Islamic financial institution to focus on merchant development, infrastructural and agriculture types of banking and finance and spend on R&D in this regard. Risk sharing, encourage on risk sharing mindset among all stakeholders of the Islamic finance industry, Islamic bank and clientele, Jack Team Pulse conducted a diagnosis study on the own team to evaluate the staff members' understanding of Islamic finance offering, as there is a criticism that the entire Islamic banking industry is owned by the people who come from the conventional uh, space with the conventional thought process. So we really need to educate those who work in this industry as well. And bound documentation from the legalistic part, there's a need to verify the transactions through side visits and other mechanisms, the approval of the Sharia de development or the board. So the Islamic perspective of ethics, the very reason that you're doing a value-based um, intermediation or Islamic finance, the destroying the spirit of Sharia while preserving its form can be no good. So-called form versus um, spirit. Morals are the spirit of Sharia. One cannot claim conformity to the latter and the spirit of Sharia in the absence of good ethics. So Islamic finance overwhelming focus on jurisprudential technicalities, is it really desirable? Instead of upholding the higher moral Sharia, keeping in mind the bigger picture, contemporary Sharia scholars have generally focused on ways and means to Islamize contemporary conventional products and services using technicalities of jurisprudence. If the Islamic economic and financial system is different from the conventional system, then these differences ought to be real and tangible rather than cosmetic and technical. If the difference between Islamic and the conventional system is diluted or blurred, the very basis of the former will be rightfully challenged. So let me conclude. Harmonization Islamic finance practices and the adoption of global best practices have enabled Islamic finance to evolve from being a boutique offering initially to being recognized by the International Monetary Fund as systemically important in over 14 jurisdiction is now offered by more than 300 financial institutions across 60 countries with growing consensus that the objectives of generating returns and priorities global social welfare are not mutually exclusive. Investors are exploring Islamic finance to complement their EAG investments for enhanced overall risk adjusted return and greater portfolio diversification while building more sustainable economies. So we need to bring the global awareness to increase the size of the pie. So Islamic finance 
and takaful for Muslims only right now. We are on this space. Mostly 90% of our um, product are taken by the Muslim uh, consumers and investors. We need to increase the size of the pie. What is your target market? Make it global. Islamic finance and takaful for people of all faiths and beliefs. So Islamic finance must be branded. This is coming the marketing size at beneficial people, beneficial to people of all faiths and beliefs and not confined to the Muslim community only. And finally, we are talking about the paradigm shift here, instability to stability with Islamic finance, from deception to transparency, from deregulation to regulation, from value neutral to timeless values. And this is what Islamic finance has to achieve. And then it will be, become a value-based finance. So I want to acknowledge the writings of various authors over the years from which I have benefited immensely and whose ideas have mingled with mine in this presentation. And these are some of the references you can check and learn more about Islamic finance. Thank you for listening to me. So I'm now open for questions. Thank you, Professor Hassan. Yeah, that was really good. Um, that was kind of the floor is open for questions. I have just um, one request, please, Professor, that um, uh, is it possible to make the, the slides available for some of our attendees are asking? Sure, I will. Okay, thank I'll, you. I'll send it to um, Professor Sirhan, no problem. Thank Can you. I stop the sharing now? Yeah, well, if you leave it in case somebody wants to ask something. But, okay, so now the floor is open. Please, any questions, feel free to ask directly or you can type it. Um, here is one first question um, in the chat. says, this is from Dr. Tariq. Thanks, Dr. Kabir. My question is, uh, how can we increase Islamic financial awareness among the Muslim community? I think the best way of doing this using our um, um, places of worship, like the mosque. So in, during the khutbah, Friday prayer, we can have, you know, every other week talk about the commercial jurisprudence of Fika Muhammad. You know, um, very, um, when I was growing up, I hardly remember any khutbah or this speech, they talk about how to lead your life, you know, Islamic life, or talk about different types of, you know, revised haram. You have to do your uh, activities of financial life through Islamic financial principles. So I think we should start with the mosque and we should also use the social media. We also use, if in Islamic country, the TV. So that's the way we can increase the awareness among the people that look, in a conventional product that you're using, you are really valued in the Sharia principle, come to Islamic finance, that has more good to this. So we have to do a multi-pronged do, and also you have to educate uh, our future leaders of Islamic finance industries by having program, actually cutting edge program, not most of the Islamic finance degree I have, like out of 10 classes, you have eight conventional finance classes and two Sharia classes. That doesn't make it really an Islamic finance program. So you have to create a new curriculum where you combine the conventional principle and bring it in the context of Sharia or Islamic light. Thank you. Um, any other questions? Anyone else, please? Feel free to ask directly or type your question. All right, um, in the meantime, so, um, Islamic finance being, you know, viewed as older than Islamic marketing. So from your experience, what would be uh, the lessons that Islamic marketing can learn and the pitfalls that, you know, should avoid that Islamic finance went through? You know, uh, remember, uh, I was talking about different frequently asked questions. Many people still you know, have a lot of questions about Islamic finance, whether it is Islamic or not. And rightfully so, if you look at the uh, set of products that exist in Islamic finance market, are uh, it's a replication product. 
like you have a Morabaha, which is a replicated loan product. So yes, you use the legal or Sharia technicalities to make it Sharia compliant, but the essence is missing. Of course, we need a debt product. So if you look at Islamic finance space, about 95% of the product are debt based product and debt Islamic finance, I'm not saying that it's anti-debt, but it's more pro-equity and the equity really brings the risk sharing principle of Islamic finance together. So we really need to do more of this from the marketing perspective, let people know because investors, even ESG, that uh, you know everybody wants to maximize their profit using this principle risk return and so on. But long-term investing, even though you're not getting the maximum financial return, but you are getting return in other ways by preserving the nature and keeping the art clean and sustainable for your future generation. So those kind of uh, ideas has to be promoted through marketing channel and have to be told again and again, because the lack of knowledge or lack of education is a key problem of the growth of this industry, both from the consumer perspective as well as from the investor's perspective. Thank you. Uh, yeah, any other questions or comments or whatever? Okay, there is another question, Tariq Bhatti, another question, if I'm allowed publishing Islamic journals is encouraged is in Islamic journals. What do you say that how to resolve the issue? Okay, uh, okay. Is this faculty is discouraged to publish in Islamic journals? Is that it is faculty? Well, you know, you have to convince that this is a new area of academic research, new discipline. And this is what I have been doing for the last 20 years, try to promote that it's a alternative value based, which is good for everyone. So you have to tell your faculty that look, we really need to do Islamic finance is good for everyone. But the problem is because most of the universities, they have an emphasis of publishing in Scopus ISL level journals. And there are not many, um, there are none really actually, except one that I edit in International Journal of Middle Eastern Islamic Finance and Management. So that is also very difficult to do a research in Islamic finance and getting it published in a ranked journal. So, you, you know, so this, this um, problem comes from two, two sides. One, from the university, because you're not able to publish in good journals by doing research in Islamic finance. The other one, some of them discourage it because they think it's a fad, it's going to go away. I mean, it just came out because of the Middle Eastern money flushing Islamic finance industry. So 20, 30 years down the line, it will go away. But I don't think so. If you look at, if you followed my presentation, this has come a long way and people are accepting this as a value-based alternative. And the more and more non-Muslims are coming to this industry using this concept or using type of financing contracts. You don't have to be Muslim. The contract is more value-based. It is consistent with ESG framework, sustainable framework, and everything that United Nations uh, talks about. Uh, so it's good for everyone. So why not? Thank you for that. Now, uh, we still have about 10 minutes, so please uh, feel free to ask if you've got any further questions or clarifications you want to ask. Um, what would be your recommendations in terms of research areas, particularly in the, the nexus of, between marketing and finance, Islamic money? You know, there are a Journal of Islamic Marketing and many other conventional journals also, but the question is, Anything that you do, the research design has to be sound. The problem that I face as an editor, most of the research are cut and paste. There is nothing newness. So you have to really invest your time and energy in marketing. You do a lot of survey, right? Which is a, this is a big toll. So, and that probably is more prone because it's a growing nascent industry. The secondary data is not really that much available. And whatever secondary data has been there, it has been beaten to death, like you know, bank scope data or uh, the stock market data. So if you can create uh, through proper right design, survey-based uh, uh, results, 
and it can be really targeted to a good journal. So I would do go with survey-based survey qualitative research has a room to play. And actually, you can answer many of the frequently asked questions that I told you. To answer this question, a, a survey-based technique could be a better way of, of, of finding those answers and helping this industry to grow. Now, you have a risk, I said. I mean, I know, and this is very sad. You know, I travel quite extensively everywhere I go. They want to publish an Islamic finance paper in, in, a, a, in a ranked journal, Q1, Q2. I mean, they stop ABS, ABC, or SSCI. Unfortunately, there are not many takers of Islamic finance paper still now. And, but hopefully, uh, it, it's, by the way, uh, it, 20 years ago, it was very difficult to publish in a conventional uh, journal, an Islamic finance paper. But there are more and more acceptability. You will see a uh, number of top journals are publishing Islamic finance paper. So they're taking or accepting at the, from the conceptual level uh, or methodological level that this could be a new alternative form of financing. Thank you. Um, there is another question. Is it possible to reach an interest-free economic system in some countries or in the whole world? Well, in this current spectrum, I don't think so. It will be, you have to understand the conventional interest-based system is about 400 years old. They have perfected their system. Whatever shortcoming it has, of course, Oh, we have proven it and all the crises that happened shown it that the system is unstable. This conventional system, it creates inequity into the world. So those who are uh, making money and rich people, they have made money out of this inequitable system itself. So you are basically declaring jihad against this and existing system. So right now you're less than 1% of the total world financial market when you grow 10%, that's what you will see. They try to, they will try to kill you. But right now, they're sort of okay because oh, another thing you have to remember: who are the biggest players in Islamic finance? It's not really Muslims or the Muslim institution. It's the international institutions are paying big because they have realized there is an untapped market. They can make money out of this thing. So I don't think that in our lifetime is going to happen. But sooner or later, people try to realize. And many influential writers, as Piketty's paper, I mean, book, if you read the inequality that has been created by the conventional system or capitalist system. So people are thinking at that high level and that will have an influence and that will spill our effect. And eventually there will be more and more take care of these principles that has been laid out in the Quran and Sunnah. Now, if you don't want to mention Quran, Sunnah, fine. Ethical finance, the, the essence of Islamic finance is very much acceptable to all the religions that I have talked about in my presentation. Thank you. Um, any other, any takers, any questions, comments? Yeah, we still have a few minutes, so feel free, please do. Uh, uh, I just uh -huh. uh, want to say uh, one thing, those who are aspiring Islamic finance scholar, or you want to, you know, you have to be patient. Uh, you have to really do your homework. Uh, don't try to be an Islamic finance scholars overnight. It doesn't. Those who come from Arabic background, you do have a comparative advantage like Zakaria. You can go to the original text. I would really ask you to go back to the original text, be a commercial jurisprudence scholar and try to make meaning out of existing Sharia compliant, go to the Islamic history and learn from there and try to do research that will be helpful in order to uh, uh, offset the criticism that we have that Islamic finance industry is basically a mimicking industry. All it is doing using, you know, wrapping Sharia around a product, like for example, a, a, a pork uh, sandwich, you are wrapping this around with, with, um, with beef and you're saying there's a beef burger. So those kind of criticism in order to really do this, you really need to go back to the sources, understand carefully and try to promote it. One of the problems that I face, there are very world-class Sharia Islamic, Sharia scholar mean 
I'm talking about the commercial pick up Muhammad scholars in the Arabic world, but some way that translation has not been got into Islamic, I'm sorry, English speaking world. So that's where also a treasure lies. You know, those who come from, you know, bilingual Arabic and English, those books and those ideas should be translated, should be researched on and make this research available to the rest of the world. And that will be very helpful. Try to avoid to do, you know, data mining. I do a lot, I'm tired of it. And many often, yeah, I can tell you, having reached this level, I have been in the academy for 31 years, 80% of the Islamic finance paper, and it, is, it came out top journals. I ask myself at the end, what is Islamic finance in this paper? Very often you have to write a paper yeah, yeah, uh, to, uh, to, to uh, please the editors or the referees, but you are not really finding Islamic finance anywhere. Let's say, for example, if we say efficiency of Islamic banks. Okay, fine. So you find this efficient or inefficient, but how does it help for the Islamic bank to be more Sharia compliant than anything else? So I am getting, because of my age maybe, because I have, been, I have done it uh, for many years, you know, data crunching. Yes, at initial stage, you're a young scholar. Uh, you need to do some data mining, data crunching and so on, but don't do it, overdo it. You know, you don't have to, you do it a sort of optimal way so that you keep your job, get promoted, you get uh, salary raises and so on, but try to focus on the essence of Islamic finance and try to promote to the wider generation. The awareness is very important. And if somebody you know, doesn't understand econometrics or machine learning, and he or she will be you know, completely um, off by reading an article by you. But if it is written in a vernacular way that a common person's or layman's language, it will have a more impact in, in creating awareness and making it more accessible. This is the marketing part I'm talking about to the wider community, the wider um, stakeholders. Thank you very much, Professor Hassan. On that note, I think we come to the conclusion of this session.